this has been an amazing journey and um, I just feel really emotional right now. Bill McReady rolls to his right and throws into the end zone. Pete Pios makes a diving catch. I was hesitant. I thought it was some sort of scam. What are the odds? You know, there aren't that many people that remember them. They might vaguely kind of remember the name, but they certainly don't know the story. And it's an amazing story. It really is. Oh, well, looks good. Looks pretty. Yeah. He would love those colors because he was so patriotic. Mm -hmm. In that whole greatest generation sense, Pete Pijos represented a lot of that. He was as accomplished as a soldier as he was as a football player, and he was a Hall of Fame football player. One of the things that's really lovely about the story is that Melissa has kind of been in a quest to learn more about her father. Look, that says Pete and Goon. Who is Goon? Look at Kind that. of connect with her father. Mm -hmm. He was 51 when I was born, so that's like, how I know him from 51 and up. Oh, this is a great one. He's with President Nixon. I have the autograph right here. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what he was like as a player and a person. When I mention the name PP is what's the first thing that comes to mind. Somebody we couldn't cover. Steve Van Buren and Pete Pios were my childhood heroes. When I was researching him, I wanted to go back in time to see what he was like. His parents immigrated from Greece. His father was murdered in Orlando in 1937. They had like a breakfast joint and someone came in and hit him 15 times in the back of the head with a hatchet. And they never found the person. I just feel like it, it really affected him as he moved forward in his life. I think he had a lot of anger when his father mm -hmm. died. He said he did. And I think that pushed him to be better, stronger in football. It was a way to get rid of his anger. That's Indiana. That's his all-star shirt. In 1944, Indiana University All-American Pete Pijos traded his football uniform for one from the United States Army and became part of the 35th Infantry that fought in Normandy in the Battle of the Bulge. He served under Patton. He loved General Patton. He talked about him all the time. I was born on June 6th, which is when... D-Day. And so he always was like, you're a D-Day baby. But then he would never talk about the war at all. I think it really affected him. Mm -hmm. But I did watch Saving Private Ryan with him and we watched the first scene and I turned to him and I said, was it like that? And he said, yep. He did say the water was very blood. He remembers the water being just red. I asked him if he had, if he killed people and he said, yep. I think he had some trauma from it, you know, experiencing that. All you do is say, I, I hope today I, I get, I get live through it and everything comes out right. And I hope that I take care of my men the same way. Ooh, these are little cards from Paris. Free Paris. Is that money? Yeah, there's different money. That's German. Deutsche. Pijos was commissioned as a second lieutenant on the battlefield and earned a bronze and silver star. After the war, he returned to Indiana, then began his pro career in 1947 with the Eagles. It seems counterintuitive to talk about a guy who's in the Hall of Fame as being underrated. But uh, I think Pete Pijos fits that description. 
when you look back at what he accomplished and what he contributed to the two world championship teams. I mean, he ranks among the greatest players ever to wear an Eagles uniform. But you stop the average Eagles fan today and mention Pete Pios, they have no idea who you're talking about. I think you can say that Pete Pios was the first tight end uh, because that's the game that he played. Now, no one used that term back then, but he had all the attributes of a tight end and a great one. The tight end screen, or the middle screen, I guess they called it, was really kind of their creation. And sometimes you still see it today. That was built around Pihos' strengths. The idea was to try and get him the ball in the middle of the field and let him just run with it. I can't get him down. <laughs> I can't ever get him down. That's amazing. Five men, six men against him. He was very strong. I mean, when you look at the footage of him, no one took a ball away from him. He took the ball away from the defense. I can tell you this, I never drop a pass, period. If they hit my hands, it was caught. Mm, I don't know how he caught that. If you looked at the footage, the evidence is there. I think it is literal truth. He never dropped a catchable pass. That was one of the things that Pete said bothered him about modern football. You know, he didn't begrudge the modern players the money they made, the fame, and all the other things that come with modern football. But the one thing he couldn't abide was guys that drop passes. <laughs> you do get angry at the players today when you watch football and they drop the ball. Oh, so yeah. You're, <laughs> you're supposed to pick it up. It's what you're being paid for. That's what he says it every day. Breaking through like this was not uncommon for Pihos. He played both sides of the ball. One year that they did specialize, and they took him from offense and put him on defense, and he became a defensive end. He made all pro. And then the next year, they said, well, this is kind of silly. Let's put him back on offense. And he led the league in receptions. I see why he's in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. When you talk to the guys who were on that team, they talk about just how tough-minded he was and how intolerant he was of guys who weren't as committed as he was. He had no use for anybody that he considered a slacker. Being a star is not the thing that counts. The most important thing is that you did your job properly and that you were a winner. He wasn't always the most popular guy in the locker room for that reason, but he was a guy who was universally respected. And uh, I could see a little bit of the same thing in Melissa. I can kind of see why she's very good at what she does because I think some of those traits got handed down. My dance, I'm so serious. Like, people, like, why are you so serious? And I'm like, I don't know, I got it from my dad, I think. He was always writing me letters about how I need to just keep moving on with my dance and make a career out of it, and I did. I'm a dance professor at Valdosta State. University. I went to uh, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro getting my MFA in dance. You have to do a thesis like performance and so I wanted to do something about my dad's amazing story and then his battle with Alzheimer's. The one I made about him was Pihos, a moving biography. I love you. Thank you. I love you. I think he stayed alive for me to finish it. I did show it to him on video, and then he was like, okay, I'm gonna go now. You know, you're done with your project. After her father's death in 2011, Melissa took her show on tour and created an Alzheimer's Association fundraiser. In March, I got this strange email and it said, Medal of your father. And I was like, what in the world is this? Like, and so this woman, her name was Sylvette. She said she found a medal of my father in a forest in France and near her house. I was hesitant. I thought it was some sort of scam. I emailed her back 
She's like, well, would you like to have them? She had researched like the 35th Infantry coming through there and liberating her city. And she showed me exactly where she founded the forest. And I was like, okay, this lady's like, she's legit, you know? And she got my address and she sent them to me. This is a dog tag. And she said, I learned a new word. Well, I cried when I got it. It just has this energy of history and my dad, like I imagine him wearing it, you know, and fighting in the war. I was so proud of him yet again, and I had worked so hard to uncover his story, and then here yet is another part of it. What are the odds? Like, I felt like this was just some sort of, he wants to be remembered in a certain way, and there's that proud competitiveness coming back out maybe from, from beyond. <laughs> And then I wrote her back and sent her a picture of my dad. She loved it. And she said she was going to frame it and put it up so he could watch over her as he watched over me. I was kind of a little bit done with humanity during COVID, and um, that kind of also invigorated me to like, oh, there's still like create humans out there to just, you know, contact me and send me this um, awesome piece of history. I want to see the forest and kind of walk around. I would like to meet her. Bonjour. My dad was here fighting in World War II. This is where Sylvette found my dad's dog tag. I wish Sylvette could be here, but she didn't want to be on film. She's a very private person. She just was worried about the pandemic. It was a very emotional experience for me. I can't even think about how to describe this right now. I was happy to be there, but then also thinking about him being there, fighting in a war, how scared he must have been. And then I also miss him. That's another part of this trip, is I'm reconnecting with him through this. So here's where it was found. I could feel dad with me at all times. It just meant the world to me. He's happy that I'm doing this.